This is part one of the Mark Thomas experience. Enjoy. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, politics, and entertainment, who are here to share their wisdom and their use of humour with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve every aspect of your business and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is an award-winning comedian, journalist and formerly host of the Mark Thomas comedy product on Channel 4, where he was well known for pulling political practical jokes. He revels in combining comedy with political activism. As an alternative comic, he's built a career in the sweet spot between politics, comedy and investigative journalism. Most recently, he's the author of the brilliantly enlightening and hilarious 50 Things About Us, What We Really Need to Know About Britain, where he takes a closer look at lesser known facts about our nation. Despite winning the Time Out Comedy Award and being awarded the Kurdish National Congress Medal of Honour, I believe that his most impressive achievement is his Guinness World Record for hosting 20 political protests in under 24 hours. Mark Thomas, welcome to the Humorology Podcast. Hello, mate, you see. What the viewer and the listener doesn't know is we see each other every week or so at the football at AFC Wimbledon. I I rather like that. I like the fact that we have a sort of, not just that we meet every week, but we know where we're going to meet and we know when we're going to meet. And that at halftime, we will always meet under the little flyover and uh, and that'll be us. We'll be just by the bar and a group will gather and we will dissect and discuss the failures, uh, occasionally the successes of the team. Um, And I kind of, yeah. I think it's one of my highlights, actually. I love I love our little meetings, uh, just the way that people congregate around. It is. It's, I, mean, I mean, that's really what it is. For people who don't know, that's the, the community of football, whereby, and it's beautiful at AFC Wimbledon, because that happens. If only the football could match the beauty of those moments. Well, do you know, I was doing a gig the other night. It was, in fact, on Saturday night, after Wimbledon had lost, and I said, I, I follow AFC Wimbledon and a whole load of people at the Banana Cabaret, which, you know, has got that balcony at the top. So yeah. you do it. And I said, you do it. You do it. All of this was going on. Scared the fuck out of the middle class in the centre. They really wobbled. <laughs> it was just absolutely brilliant. And it, and, and it was very funny just talking about, I said, you know, I don't, you know, I follow Wimbledon, not for the football, but because um, I really like singing in public and I'm not religious. So all I've got is is the football and in fact i think church would be improved if you put in on sunday highlights from saturday over the altar during communion because you get a whole load of football fans in the the singing would just be brilliant well well, yeah and just as the priest was uh, about to do the sacrament you go you're saved (laughs) 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 we are baptists Super Baptists! So you'd get all of that going on. Oh God! No, I think, I think, I think there's a, there's a plan there. Um, My old uh, man said, "Be a Methodist." I said, "Fuck off, bastard!" Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I think we found our level. I got heckled as well on Saturday night by a woman who just very drunkenly went, "I'm an RE teacher at a Catholic girls' school." <laughs> It's just like, that's lovely. That's lovely. Is there anyone else who doesn't have sex? <laughs> oh, what a great, great comeback. Oh, well, well, we'll come on to heckles and uh, and, yeah. and life on the circuit later on, because um, I want to start with you grew up in southwest London um, yeah. with a midwife mother and a, a self in boy employed builder father what was humor actually valued at home yeah 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 I mean it was I mean really special because my dad was quite violent 
and uh, ge genuinely was he, he would um there was a stage where we, we, we would turn up in court once a year to see him bound over to keep the peace this is completely true and um we were just we we were the family we were the happy family who were put in the courtroom do you know what i mean and um my dad because he was he was a lay preacher as well as a builder and also foul mouthed and and physically violent um he he, he got on very well with the um with, with the bloke next door who was a salvation army captain who loved my dad he loved my dad and uh, so this guy who was from norfolk used to come and do he used to be the character witness and he's standing there going, I have known Colin Thomas for many years. Colin is a family man. Colin is a Christian man. Colin is a whole. We're all standing there going, I wish I knew this bloke. He sounds great. So <laughs> yeah, humour was quite important because it, it, not only was it a way of sort of like, it was a very hierarchical, you know, sort of like uh, paternal, you know, literally my dad was Old Testament. You know, he looked like Moses with syphilis and he had this incredible uh, sort of physical strength to him and so when you're intimidated like that the one thing you've got is humor that's the one thing you have and humor always had a special place in the house because it was the one place where my dad could relax it was the one thing you could feel safe um so and this is just true my dad would come in after work and he would have it, it, there was a whole ritual of putting away the scrap metal and you know cutting up wood and all this kind of stuff and and he would have his bath in the morning. My dad always had a bath in the morning. So it was clean for work, which showed his priorities. <laughs> and said, all right, love, let's just snuggle up next to the concrete dust. Come on. But, you know, he was. Um, and he had this old pair. He had these favorite leather armchairs. And what he used to do was he'd come in uh, after tea, after he'd sorted out all the words and the scrap metal and all of that. He'd go into the living room and he'd sit in his favorite leather armchair, but he didn't want to get his builders. He didn't want to get his dirty builders trousers on the chair. So he'd drop his trousers around his ankle and sit in the leather armchair in his long johns. Right. Laugh. And I always used to go, this is this is great because he'd laugh at step turn some for being uncouth. And it was just like it was perfect. And on more than one occasion, because people used to come round, right, to um after tea to ring the doorbell and go, all right, Colin, we've got a bit of a job on for you. So all local people used to turn up and you'd discuss the business on the doorstep. And um, more than once you'd hear my dad go, oh, but put me fucking trousers on. And so he would, and he would go to the door. But that one place, it was that one place. So it was the one place that humour was allowed. And Dave Allen and um, Steptoe and Son were the heroes. They were the absolute heroes. Um, Steptoe and Son, my dad, because they, it was sort of like, it was Gordon the Simpson, it was written brilliantly. Um, and I, and, and it reflected some part of his experience. Do you know what I mean? Of 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 working class and 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 making do of fine. Like my dad would never throw anything out. He'd never throw every, everything was safe. He was an environmentalist before it became fashionable. He used to save everything. My job when I was eight, I used to burn the lead off of brass fittings with a blowtorch and catch it in a in a ladle. And it was all to prepare everything for the scrapyard. Well, you, let me tell you a story. We used to go out the scrapyard, right? And there was a they, they had a car crush. Everyone knew my dad. There was, it was where actually the scrapyard is where. Um, the uh, that that big lovely place in Chelsea is, you know, Chelsea Arbor, you know, that posh, oh, yes, yes, that's where the scrapyard used to be. They wow. used to have a scrap metal crusher, car crusher, and we get there one day and the car crusher's on fire, right? And the bloke running it is standing there with a fag and a cup of tea, and there's a few members of fire brigade. My dad went, Bloody hell, he said, Yeah, someone left some petrol in the tank. Normally, you drain it, but someone must have left it in and a few sparks, and bang, up it goes. And my dad went, bloody hell. He said, how often does... He said, all you can do is just stand around. Just stand around, have a cup of tea and a fag and wait for it to call the fire brigade. All you've got to do is wait for it to go out. You can't do anything. And my dad said, how often does this happen? He said, every time I've got a hangover. <laughs> <laughs> so step two and son represented a part of my dad's existence. Do you know what I mean? Dave Allen was just a genius. Did you not write... Dave Allen I tried to I was I was very bad at it I was very bad at it I adored Dave Allen I thought he was he was just he was him and Billy Connolly are the nearest we've got so you see Dave Allen and you see Billy Connolly right I, I, I was talking to a mate about this 
Peter Cook was described by John Cleese as the gatekeeper for the field that we now all play in. I described Alexis Sale as the bloke who booted down the squat so that we could all get in yeah. and muck about. Um, in that squat on the wall was a picture of Billy Connolly where Jesus should have been because we could never be like him. We would never ever ever we could have people like alexi sale and peter cook and you know john clay and all those people who could inspire us but billy Connolly, dave allen we would never be as good as them they were genius yeah we're, we're... so this was the story i was going to tell you paul what it was was the power of a joke i'm banished from the doorstep when the business meetings are going on Right. After tea, doorbell, bloke comes around. I need you to fix the gutters. How do you think you can da 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 da? You have a little natter, you have a dance, you do the thing. My dad come turns and says, I'll put you in the book. Right. That's how it goes. And there's a lot of how's your missus, how's that? Did you see so and so? It's all that kind of stuff. But kids aren't allowed on the doorstep. That's just when the business is done, kids aren't allowed on. So we're watching Step Down Sun. The doorbell goes, it's Jim from like three on the other side. Um and he, Jim Darby was his name. And he comes over to talk to my dad. And Steptone Son is on. And it's at the time that VAT has just been introduced, right? Uh, so VAT didn't exist until the early 70s when it came in. And there was a joke on it. And he goes, when is he going to come and visit us? He said, what you want about? He said, the prime minister. What about you? The prime minister visiting us? Yeah, VAT, visiting all totters. Now, totters was what scrap metal merchant used to be called. So visiting all totters. My dad used to call himself, I'm a totter. So that's what, so I heard the gag, thought it was hysterical, ran out onto the doorstep. Uh, Jim Diver goes, all right, little, and my dad goes, get out of it, you know, and I said, when's he going to visit us? He said, what's you on about? I said, the Prime Minister, my dad goes, what? I said, VAT, and Jim Darby goes, VAT, I said, visiting all totters, and they both laughed, and Ooh. Jim Darby said, you got a right one there, Colin, and my dad held my hand, let me stay on the doorstep, power of a joke. Oh, man, so wh that was the seminal moment, was it, where you suddenly she went? Yeah, yeah. when you could see it. You know, something hits you inside and you go, that's how powerful this is. And 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 I mean, but were you therefore then the the kid at school who actually thought I'm going to do this? And 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 well, the, the class clown classic, you know, um, branding of sort of sort of I was. I used to be able to impersonate all the other boys really well. And so it kind of saved me from getting clumped every now and again. Um, yeah. uh, but also, I, I wasn't bad at clumping people. So. <laughs> <laughs> Best of both worlds. Yeah. I always like proper creative mischief, something that would really cause someone some distress. Do you know what I mean? You, you, want, to, you want mischief to be. My mate once was. was uh, at school, they had these study rooms, and my mate once had his nose broken by a, a bully. And so when he left, we got into his study room, and he had all these posters and everything. Um, we got hold of some, like, some really thick, uh, like a, a brie cheese, like a soft cheese, like primulas and stuff like that, and we smeared it all over the walls and then put the posters back on, right? <laughs> For the next six months, he was just going, what the fuck is it in here? I don't know what it is. I've tried everything. <laughs> and it is just that kind of like, we'll get you. Yeah. Well, yeah the, so that's the through line in it. Was it I mean, was, was there also what I would call a show-off gene in there as well? Because I yeah. think we all kind of had it in a certain of way look we are just highly evolved show-offs who get paid money for showing off that's what it basically is we are the baboons with the brightest asses that's what it is <laughs> right and you know what we do is show off and we show off in creative ways um and and i love that i love that i, I love the fact that um 
like you, you, you know when you do a, like I did a gig on Saturday and the audience were half there half not it's 40 minutes now there's loads and loads of political stuff some of it they jumped on some of they didn't but I really fucking rammed them and got them and all of that and it was just like a fucking battle and at the end of it I walked up to and there's half a dozen comics and their mates and they went that was fucking rock and roll mark and it was like that's what matters yeah those eight people on the balcony my peers that's what matters but that was always the way wasn't it uh, that, that we were always much more interested in um going back to uh, the audience should know that we first met in 1985 at the comedy store yeah, yeah, yeah. which is um and it was always more important that your peers um liked what you did and i yeah. i remember we used to play a lot of the time to kim kinney and Stan, in the, who was the sound man, and if they were laughing, the whole audience could be quiet. But if they laughed, you you'd kind of won, hadn't you? Yeah, yeah. And I I loved it when you used to be able to get when they were running gags when everyone had to try and put a word into the set on the late show or something <laughs> stupid like that. Comquat. I remember Comquat <laughs> just appearing, and it was, sometimes people couldn't put it in their set, so it would just go, "I'm so and so." Comquat and then leave. <laughs> <laughs> and, it was just, uh, uh, and I think you have to have those little things. So you, 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 you know, comedy works on all sorts of different levels, and it also represents all sorts of different threats. And it's also, you know, it, 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 it's is as welcoming as it is threatening. It depends who you are. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Um, I'll give you an example of this. When a uh, uh, we used to have big Sunday do's, right? So my nan lived with us, so everyone come round. And my dad built this enormous table. Everyone would get round this table. Everyone would squeezed up. Sunday lunch, you'd go down the Lord Napier Jazz Pub, lunchtime, right? All in the builders' vans, bouncing around. And you'd get a few pints in, listen to the jazz, and you go back. And Sunday lunch would appear and there'd be all sorts. There'd be uncles and aunts and, you know, cousins. And there'd always be someone you didn't know. There'd be a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Once my uncle Norman brought back a woman. He said, I, I met her in the pub. She just didn't have anywhere to go. And I'm like, thanks for bringing her home. So, you know, there's all these people turned up for Sunday lunch. And we sit now. I used to have a girlfriend called Jo who's from Manchester, from Ermston. And she always used to try and kind of make herself kind of access to the family by using London colloquialisms. Do you know what I mean? She used to yeah, try yeah. To, just to try and get herself more in with the family. And I remember once we were sitting there, my uncle Norman goes, Joe, do you want to, do you want to top up with your wine? And she turned around and went, yeah, just a minge. And my uncle Norman, <laughs> he thought minge meant a small amount of top up. I mean, I'll just have a minge. And my uncle Norman just played it straight and went, do you want a minge? Would everyone get Joe a minge, please? Do you want a red wing minge or a white minge? Do you want a minge? Okay, get a, would someone get Joe a red minge and played it for about five minutes before we all just cracked up and told her what it meant? Anyway, ever since that moment, a minge, as in our house, means a small amount of liquid, right? Yeah. So, uh, and it's kind of like used as a family thing. So when my, my nephew George brought his girlfriend around once, he goes, Nan, do you want a cup of tea? And she went, just a minge of milk. And it was just, <laughs> yeah, you just have to go. So that's what it means now. So humour becomes this way of inviting you into the gang. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? That, that it is a gang. And, uh, and how we relate to people is, do you get this? Do you know it? Here's the initiation ritual. Come and join us. So how important is that in everyday life because i think it's crucial that if you don't if you don't actually and this doesn't this the, i we we were just doing an um interview with uh helena kennedy um the the baroness helena kennedy who's the um equal opportunities uh lawyer and uh, and she was fascinating about this that she came from the south side of glasgow tenements and now she's in the House of Lords and that humour is still that conduit that allows her into all these spaces, which she's. Just... And I think that you are allowed in any space because of your playfulness and you are funny, which is kind of the the entry ticket, isn't it? 
I think it is. It does let you into places that you wouldn't normally get into. And um, I mean, it's it's humor's used all over the place. Do you know what I mean? And it's not just the social interaction. It allows social interactions. It allows us to be self-deprecating and, re- and pull back the threat of ourselves. It allows us to give someone who thinks they're better than us a little slap, you know, gently and just put them in the... There is the shared thing where you share something. You laugh at something that's around you or someone who's near you and you share something. So you bond together. So humor is really, really important for that. But I think there's a bigger... I mean, it's socially, it's vital. It's absolutely vital. You couldn't exist. You know, uh, was it Chaplin who said a day without laughter is a wasted day? Oh. You know, which is beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. And um, Orwell actually said each joke is a revolution, a tiny revolution, which I think is kind of like, yeah, but you've you've obviously never been bullied properly because each joke isn't a tiny revolution. Each joke is where well, you're either going up or you're going down. You know, you're punching up or you're punching down. You're making someone the target who's worthy of being a target or you're attacking someone who's not worthy of being a target and bullying. So that's the, the the essence of satire. Why would you why would you go after people who aren't in power? You need to go after people who are in power. That's the whole gig of it. Um, and people in power don't like it. Well, it's because they can't they can't play at that level, can they? Because it's like oh, any totalitarian regime, the first thing they do is close down theatre and comedy because yeah, uh, because they can't control it. They can't control it. And there's that great quote. I'm I'm bastardizing it, but it's the truth is written on the toilet door. Do you know what I mean? That actually that's going to be yeah, that's where you find the last bastion of freedom of speech is the back of a toilet door. Um, it's also where you find some very interesting people, Paul. <laughs> oh, um, it, 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 there is something to be said for that. And I think the thing that, that they don't like is is taking away respect. You can rule through fear. This is the name of the rose. You can rule through fear, but laughter will undermine fear, Mm. right? Laughter undermines it. And you've only got to look at how many cartoonists are jailed in Turkey, in Saudi Arabia, in Qatar, in Egypt, you know, how many, you know, cartoonists who are shot dead, uh, not just in Paris, but around the world, um, you know, in Chile, cartoonists were rounded up, you know, these are people in power don't like this feeling that we're all laughing at them. They don't like it because it spreads and that undermines their authority, it undermines their fear. And who knows, we might actually take them out of power. Well, and it's also they can't control it and yeah. uh, they don't like anything that they can't uh, control. And so <laughs> at which point, I mean, in South Africa, you know, I, I had a mate who actually was part of a theatre group, but had to leave in the middle of the night because he got word that they were coming after the theatre yeah. group. Well, it says in, in, in Myanmar, the Mustache Brothers are a, a, a satirical group and they were jailed. They were just banged up. You know, they used to appear on demos occasionally. And you could go, you could, you could go and see them if you're a tourist. You could go and see the satirical show. Uh, but they'd be banged up if they performed it in public. So let the tourists see it, but don't let the populace at it. You know, this still goes on. Um, it went on during... Um, you know, Britain actually had the censorship laws, you know, up until the late 50s, I think it was, where everything had to go through the Lord Chancellor and you had yes. a blue pencil, right? And so so radio sketches, telly sketches, anything that a double act had to go through the Lord Chancellor. Um, uh, songs had to go through the Lord Chancellor, you know. Um, uh, and so you ended up with, with people who would have, there'd be blue pencil marks through the things you couldn't say. And in fact, one comic used to use the word blue pencil instead of swearing. I was walking down the blue pencil road the other day and this right blue pencil comes up. So he would be, and it was like a way of undermining the censorship as well as acknowledging it. So you get people like, you'd also you get lewdness. People were accused of lewdness. Harry Champion was taken to court. Uh, Harry Champion did boiled beef and carrots and any old iron and was taken to court for singing lewd songs. 
And in court, he was he stood on he stood up and said, Your Honor, I ain't paid to step upon the musical stage and sing hymns. <laughs> it's just such a lovely thing. People don't people in the authority want you to keep the authority, they want to keep the respect. So actually, humor undermines it, and it's brilliant. That's what it's fantastic at. Well, I, I think you're you're quite right, and you've used it as kind of a battering ram um to to actually find the truth haven't you a lot of the time well, i think it's not just find the truth you want to i mean it, it, it's changing things you want to change things we did a thing i'll tell you can i, I can't tell you a very quick story it's an old yeah. answer, right and it well, this actually happened there's a law called the condition exempt works of art list where if you inherit works of art you put them on a list and you don't get to pay tax right it applies to land and buildings and all of this the thing was you couldn't find out what works of art were there, who had them, where they were, how you could see them. So you had a theoretical right to see them. We allowed you not to pay tax, but you had to let the public in. But the public weren't allowed to know where it was or who had it or how to get there, right? We So we did a campaign. We found out <clears throat> some of the people who'd got, we found out a few bits and pieces about people who were on the list. One of them was Nicholas Soames. Nicholas Soames was ex-Arms Forces Minister uh, and good friends of Charles Windsor uh, and was once described by a girlfriend, who's a very large man, he was once described by a former girlfriend in private eye. He said, making love with Nicholas Soames was like having a large cupboard fall on you with the key sticking out. <laughs> now, he had a lovely three-tier mahogany party reeded slender baluster upright mahogany coffee table, of which I'm incredibly fond. And he hadn't paid tax on it. So we had a right to visit it. So I wrote saying, can I come and see your three-tier mahogany coffee table, partially really slender balance rock right supports? He said, yes, you can. Uh, make an appointment. So we made an appointment. A couple of days before, I said, I got in contact and said, look, some mates of mine have, have heard about the three-tier mahogany buffet table with partially really slender balance rock right supports. We were talking about it in the pub. It's very popular. Um, they'd like to come along. You wouldn't believe how popular it is. And he said, well, they can't. I said, well, they've got a right to see it. He said, yes, if they wish to see it, they should make individual applications. So we got about 300 people to make individual applications to see the three-tier mahogany coffee table with partially really slender balance rock right supports. He goes nuts, puts it in Chris his auction house over two weeks and people can go in right and so we arrived to see it and we were encouraging people just getting loads of people come and see it come and see it and um we, we dressed up as works of art so my mate came as the mona lisa uh, another friend of mine uh came as a salvador dali painting so they had a clock falling out of them uh my mate paul came as robert mapplethorpe in a bold move in chaps and a leather thong and um <laughs> Uh, so we, we're queuing up and they said, you can't film, you can't take photographs because they were frightened we'd put it on the telly show and it'd get more people on. We said, you can't film, no photography. So we had bought every other method of recording an image. We had got clay modellers, we got pipe modellers, we had got courtroom artists, we had got sketches, we had got etcher sketches, we <laughs> had got everything. We had got people with very good memories who were going at six foot three long. And, you know, it was all of it. So... um Anyway, we, we encourage people to go and see it. And a little bit later, um, mates of mine phoned up and said, look, we've tried to get to see the three-tier mahogany coffee table, but he's not replying to us. I thought, well, that's not the game. That's not how it works. So I, I phoned up the Inland Revenue and dobbed him in and said, look, I wish to report a crime. <laughs> and they said, um, well, he might not show you the coffee table for several reasons. I said, what reasons? I said, well, we can't tell you his tax affairs. I said, well, no, but what, what, what are the reasons? He said, well, one is he might not show you it because he had had it destroyed. And I said, I have heard of no such tragedy befalling the house of Soames. He said, neither have I. Uh, he said, the other reason is someone might have uh, uh, been stolen it. I said, I have heard of no such act of vandalism. He said, neither have I. He said, the third and final reason is someone might not let you see it because they've paid the tax. I said, has he? He said, I can't possibly disclose personal tax information. However, that is the third and final reason. So years pass by and I see I'm visiting an MP in Port Carlos House. I'm walking past the atrium where they've got all the coffee shops 
and all the like MPs and secretaries and lobbyists are all sitting around. And I see Nicholas Holmes and I rush over and just sit in front of him very rudely and go, Nicholas Holmes, do you remember me? Mark Thomas, Channel 4. He goes, yes. I said, you've got three-tier mahogany buffet table, partially really slender baluster upright supports. He said, yes. I said, I hope you're looking after it. He said, yes. I said, did you take it off the list? He said, yes. I said, did you pay tax? He went, yes. I was like, fucking gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. And we changed the law on that. We mentioned in the House of Commons of changing the law, tightening up the loopholes, you know, and it's it's that's really exciting that you can use it like that, that you can use comedy like that. That you know, I've ended up giving um evidence before the select committee on three or select committees on three occasions, right? Once was before privileges, the privilege committee that were looking at public office people in public bodies. And there's quite strict rules on public bodies about what you should declare. And we found loads and loads of cases of people who hadn't declared things. So what we did, we've got Howard Marks, the convicted drug smuggler, and Joe Guest, who is a female model. And Joe Guest turned up. She was great. She turned up. She goes, I've got the kit on if you want me to wear it. And no, we're all right. We're all right. And we got Howard Marks and Joe Guest to phone up all these people going, you've made mistakes on your entries over your public bodies and the requirements. We'd like you to apologise for it. So we were getting, you know, glamour models and drug dealers to, to phone up and have a go at them. Funniest, the funniest moment, I thought, Joe Guest arrives with all this stuff and the production manager goes, bloody hell, because she's got these enormous pair of stilettos, like perspex stilettos. And Catherine says, how'd you walk in those? And she went, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so you can use humour in all sorts of ways. Joe Guest use it to deflect what she does and to get an upper hand in a situation. You know, we were using it to deflate the great and the good by getting nefarious ne'er-do-wells to expose them. We then got the mob joining in to go and see rich people's, you know, works of art that they were supposed to let us see. All this stuff is humour. All of this stuff is about challenging people we we used to set up front arms companies and just say look we'd like to and you know we just felt we'd get in touch with people and just say i'm an arms dealer i want to buy some weapons and they would tell you what they'd sell and, and they'd give you the gray areas and the gray areas are the interesting bits because that's the bit where you can catch them dob them in and lobby the government to change the law so do you well, I think you obviously do, but the 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 old adage about the truth goes down easier with a joke attached. Can you can you actually get to the nub of the problem um, with a joke attached easier? I, I really think you can. I think it was, um, you know, so it's one of these things. You you know, it's this idea about can you laugh about anything, and and the answer is yes and no. It depends who's laughing. It depends who's laughing at. And it depends whose experience you're mocking. You know, can you laugh at child abuse? No. Can you mock Gary Glitter? Yes. Do you know what I mean? That's the difference. Yeah. And I think it's a really important difference. Um, should we laugh at Prince Andrew? Yeah. Yeah, we should. Because, you know, that's what's pushed him into the back room somewhere. You know, the threat of people just someone shouting out his a nonce at a funeral procession. You know, that's a that was like a, a, a that's amazing. Yeah. People would say, you know, well, that's disrespectful. Maybe. But actually bringing him along is disrespectful, to be honest. Yeah. I, but but it's that thing whereby you are able to prick the bubble of pomposity. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um can I tell you just a couple of quick stories? We were after the uh, Export Credit Guarantee Department. What they do is they bankroll medium to high risk exports. OK, so if you're selling weapons to a dictator. You can get the government to provide underwriting, to provide insurance. So the bank will lend the dictator the money to buy your guns and the government provide the insurance to the bank in case the dictator doesn't pay. This meant the UK government underwrote arms sales to Saddam Hussein in Iraq. The banks lent Saddam Hussein the money. Saddam Hussein bought the guns. Then he stopped paying the repayments. The government paid the banks. The banks paid the people with the guns. So everyone was square apart from Saddam Hussein and the British taxpayer. 
<laughs> so we literally paid for the bullets that were fired at British troops. God. We literally paid for them. Oh. And we went after this department quite a lot. And we had people who would leak stuff to us. And um, we exposed corruption there. We exposed wrongdoing. Uh, at one point, we chased a civil servant who was, because we used to bushwhack people, just to come up with the most inventive bushwhacking techniques. Once we just followed a bloke, he was going to a, a, a formal dinner at the Guildhall, and we just followed him in from the street. We saw where he was coming out, and we followed him in from the street, firing questions at him. And then the doormen were there, and we just walked in after them. And because we were wearing dinner jackets, and so was the, the, uh, the camera crew, they just let us in. So we followed him in i ended up in the bog with the senior civil servant asking him questions about arms deals right and and we couldn't use that footage but you know that was that was where we were going with it and we would bushwhack them all the time the great moment for us the moment it wasn't just the fact that we got them the fact that we exposed we had front page exposés do you know what i mean in the guardian a minister actually asked civil servants uh, and this, I know this is self-aggrandizing, but he said, I've actually got it somewhere. A minute, we've got all the stuff on, on data protection. It's got the minister wants us to dig for dirt on Thomas so he can rubbish him. Ooh. Right? Literally, we have that because we were going after this department. Anyway, some people I know who are trade unionists went in for a meeting with these senior civil servants. And it was at one of these towers near Canary Wharf. And they had the top floor. And they were all there on the top floor with all the windows looking out over the city. And they were about to talk, to talk about terms and conditions with the senior management. And they heard this noise and, went, and they looked round, and it was the cradle used to for window cleaners. You know, from the top yeah, of yeah. the it would go down the side of the buildings. And they turned round, and all the civil servants were under the table going, get under the table, it's Mark Thomas, get under, get under the table. <laughs> but, but they were really, but they were really worried by you. I mean, genuinely, yeah. weren't they? Because I love the fact that you actually um, got access to the police records at one stage, and you were defied... Um, described in an official police uh, document as a, a general rabble rouser and uh, i love this bit alleged comedian i, I am putting that on a poster <laughs> alleged comedian the met <laughs> comedy <laughs> review the met <laughs> i love it i mean there's stuff this i'll find you one of one of my favorite ones was um can I give this off? Because I've got yeah, the book. Yeah. Uh, I, can I give you a copy of it? Uh, let me have a look. Yes, I've got, I've got copies of the book. Which one? A hundred acts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've got a hundred acts. Here we go. So we go. Look, two people doing the same extent. thing. <laughs> and um, it was where we did. Um, I mean, basically, they had to hand over you because under data protection, you write in. And you say, I want all the information you've got me. And everyone can do this on a public body. Um, the police originally were able to avoid it because it was part of the, it was run the unit that gathered information. I was called a domestic extremist. Um, the unit that, that gathered the information worked out of ACPO, which is the Association of Chief Police Officers, which I don't know whether you know this, but it's a private company. So ACPO didn't it didn't apply the data protection, they would argue, didn't apply to them. So when all the spying stuff blew up, um, the police had to admit that had to take it in hand. And that's when you could get your information. This is one of my favorite ones. 2402, 2007. Stop the mark, war march, Trafalgar Square. About 1408 hours, the most useless use of the word about. About 1408 <laughs> hours, we spotted Mark Thomas, who is a comedian. Thomas was on a silver mountain bike with yellow forks and orange bib with protester written on the back of it and a white cycle helmet. He said hello to us as he passed and seemed very happy. I mean, <laughs> you know, that's on my official file. That's on my police file. It's, uh, what have we got here? Um, oh, yeah, we've got all sorts here. How scary is it is that there are official police files uh, well, of a comedian? What? Uh, yeah, here it is. It's got. Uh, oh, this is another one. This was from um, 
we we had a demonstration on May Day and we did a thing. I, I wasn't the organiser of it. I just went along. People called for guerrilla gardening. You would go to Parliament Square and plant fruit and vegetables, right? To par- plant a garden in the devil's patio. And um, this is what it says on that day. 1st of May, 2000. Event, Parliament Square. Mark Thomas, brackets, TV presenter and activist, stops to stand in the way of the camera, has quantity of cress on the rear of his cycle. <laughs> you crazy guy. Cress. As I, as I said, the ISIS of garnish. Cress. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, what, what, what I think is interesting about that is, is actually, I mean, I laugh at it, but I mean, uh, there, there is an element uh, the, the laughing is is coping with it because you know we've i've got i've had two three four court cases with the police right two of which i've won two of which are ongoing one of which they're about to settle um mates of mine were were, were spied upon that the, once you appear on one list you start to appear on other lists and it, this isn't me you know this is just true um, I, I appeared on the construction blacklist, right, which was a blacklist that stopped workers. If you try to organise on, you know, and this is well documented, if you try to organise uh, unions or you complained about health and safety, you could be put on a blacklist. And there are people who, who were in the middle of a building boom, didn't work for decades, you know, and this is dreadful. And I appeared on that blacklist. It was a raid by the information commissioner on this bloke's house who ran the blacklist. And um, it was funded by all the major building companies. You know, Skanska, Balfour B, E, McAlpine, Taylor Woodrow, all of that lot funded it. Um, now, you might say, oh, Mark, this is just, this is just, you know, this is self-aggrandisement and fantasy. Well, it, it's, it's not, because my name appeared on the list and I was one of the least important court cases that came up with that. And I got 10 grand's worth of compensation from McAlpine, Skanska, Balfour Beatty, Taylor Woodrow uh, for being on their lists, right? Other people got, rightly so, you know, more money for being, you know, they admitted it in court. And actually, the thing about this is, you do have to have, you know, to, to be able to go, oh, well, people have stolen my litter bins, to, but f- stolen my bins so that they could go through it and try and find stuff. You have to have a little bit of a sense of humour about that. Well, yeah, but it's a coping mechanism at, at that point, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, it is. It's but a- that's it. But also, it's, a, it's not just a coping mechanism. It's a way of reclaiming something. Right. Ah. In a way that, you know, the word queer used to be used as a a, a pejorative word. And actually, the LBTQ plus community have claimed that and and start to use queer. Not everyone does, but a a significant group of people who use the word queer as theirs. It's our word. We take this thing away from it. It's like the N word and rappers. Do you know what I mean? I, I don't have a problem with not being able to use the N word. Right. I don't have a problem with that. And I don't have a problem with people who are people of colour being able to use it. It's a way of, of, of claiming it, if you like. And so I think when you do this stuff, it's a way, you know, we had T-shirts and tea towels with domestic extremists printed up on it. Right. Um, my, my mate made me a cup and saucer, a domestic extremist, and it had a cupcake with a fuse coming out of it, you know, and. and <laughs> It's a way of claiming it and going, this is, you use this against us, but we will take it and we will run with it because we're not frightened. We're not afraid. So therefore, the humour aids resilience in that that, that sense. Oh, yeah. Of course, humour is ultimately about resilience. Anyone who's got a shit job will tell you that. Do you know what I mean? Anyone, anyone would tell you that. Um, uh, One of my favourite... I used to work on the building site. I know someone who 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 dropped a scaffold pole off the roof through the roof of a convertible Mercedes. Walked off the job. He just walked off the job. Didn't bother to say sorry. Didn't bother to collect his money. Just fucked off. That was it. Fucked. Absolutely fucked. But from that point in, he was known as Vlad the Impaler. <laughs> 
Oh. And I love that. I love, I love that, you know, that the, the people have that sense of, you know, I think the tea room is one. This is what it's really interesting. Tea rooms are where you, you used to be able to meet and talk and talk shit and fuck about and, you know, just create bonds with each other. And actually that's one of the things, you know, about, Zura contracts and, and all of that kind of stuff is that you don't have tea rooms, you don't have fixed term contracts, but people always meet up because you have to. People always, you look at Deliveroo, there's always a spot where the riders meet. There's always a spot. And that's their tea room, if you like. That's the place where they meet and they swap stories and they take advice and they say, don't do this one, do this one. And that's where they form bonds that then go on to form a trade union. No, that, that's really interesting. I, I I I want to go back to you, you worked with your dad, Colin, on on building sites, as yeah, you yeah. said, prior to working at the comedy store. Oh. Was that good grounding for what was effectively a tough school uh, at the comedy store and the tunnel and all those clubs? Well, I mean, I, I should say so I, I went to drama school as well. Uh, you know, I didn't just go. So I went yeah. to drama school to Bretton Hall College. And I was, um, my dad was very, oh, my dad was brutal, right? He literally, <clears throat> I went to, he, he, he was very pleased that I was the first person in our family to go to university. Gutted, it was drama school. <laughs> and I came back after the first term and he goes, so what did you get up to? And I described, you know, dance movement classes and then, you know, how we do improvisation and then we do study of classical text and modern playwrights and then we go on and do people's assessment plays. And my dad's only comment was, these dance classes, they make you wear tights. <laughs> It was just like, you know, I don't understand this. And so he um he did I, I he tried somehow to connect. I remember once we went to see uh, when I got a place to drama school, he was like, Yeah, well, well done. And uh, I went to we went to see the importance of being earnest at the old Vic. And it was a proper like son and father bonding thing. You know, we went there and it was fantastic production. It was really funny. It's a great play. After about 10 minutes. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> so, there were no prisoners with him. It was just kind of like you got, you just got done in. That was it. And especially on the building site, because, you know, if any of the lads were working around us, they were like, oh, you've got, you got your boy with you. And I was, you know, I wasn't the, I wasn't really interested in working there, to be honest. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was it was a way of earning money. I quite lo I'd always done it. I started working. People sometimes say to me, "Where did you become aware of? When did your political awareness grow?" And um, I used to load skips for ten p an hour when I was eight. So I used to take buckets of rubble and chuck them on the thing. And this bloke came up to me, and goes, "How much are you paying you?" I said, 10 p an hour." And he went, "That's child exploitation. That's ch slave labour, Colin. This is slave labour." And this my they go, "Fuck off out of it. Fuck off out of it." And I was like, "Hello." <laughs> but this, you've had this extraordinary background with you know one part building site, one part Breton Hall and uh, and yeah. you know uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. theatre arts degree. I mean. How does that coalesce into sort of um, the Mark Thomas? Because you've been doing it for a long time now, you know, and it, it's a very ephemeral uh, thing, comedy, but you've managed to stay relevant. How does that happen? 38 years. Um, yeah. I mean, I've always, uh, comedy is always, stand up, I've always, always loved, but it's always been, you know, uh, uh, it's stories. I've always said stand up is stories. People have got to understand that. A joke has a rule of three. That's why it's a story, a beginning, a middle, and the wrong ending. That's how it works. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So that's your, your rule of three. So stand-up is a story, just a really small story. Um, what I what I love are those stories. That The, the great thing about theatre is it's an empathy machine. Oh. Right? It allows you to see something from someone else's perspective. It allows you to experience an emotion. And I love stand up. I adore it. 
But the ones that I love are the ones where they let you in a little bit into something more. Like Steve Wright. Do you remember the great Steve Wright, the American comic? Yes, who, the very uh, deadpan American yeah. comic. Our listeners, look him up. He's, uh, you know. He, he used to stand and go, some people are afraid of heights. I'm scared of widths. Exactly. And he just had this incredible. I put instant coffee in the microwave. Went back in time. (laughs) It was just this beautiful, beautiful delivery. And just gag after gag after gag after gag after gag. And after 40 minutes, you're like, oh, show me something of yourself. Do you know what I mean? You want to, you just wanted to see some flaws, something, some something so is that where the the the, the- theatricality because i mean uh, shows uh you, you do shows now as well as stand up yeah. you know like yeah. cuckooed is a brilliant show it's a disturbing story but you make it very very funny you know the red shed is a, a story and 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 you kind of are acting it out yeah in, yeah and and but I suppose that goes back to I think the best comedians are storytellers. We talked about Connolly, you know, it's come along with me on a story. Let me change your state. You're absolutely right. Comedy is always about change. Always. And people no, it's always about change. You start not laughing, you end laughing. There's your fucking building block of change right there. That's the change. Um so it's always been about change and it's always been about pers- it's about feeling something be- experiencing something you go in and, and you feel something and you feel different when you come out um you might feel emboldened you might feel alive you might feel more vi- you know all these things that very basic thing is about change for me it's about going okay can we get people to feel things can we get people to experience something which they might not have experienced to see it from a different angle um and i love that i adore that there's something beautiful about it and it's also a shared thing it's about sharing Right. It is about uh, sharing, yeah. but I was going to—I was just going to uh, interject there because you—you—you you, you hit on something that really resonated with me, which was um, uh, in psychology. There's a saying that if you want anyone to go into any state, you have to go into that state first. And I think a lot of the real skill is about embodying that state first, and then getting people to come along with you on that story or that journey as well i think you're absolutely right you know uh, robin williams was a fine example of that you know if you ever saw him live which i did and I, he I also worked with him at the store well, when i say worked i mean he is an amazing performer i mean absolutely transformed stand-up yeah you know and, and, and my, i always loved alexi sales said he, he he said i once worked with the with Robin Williams, I was introducing him in the store and, uh, you know, it was at the end of the show, you know, I said, all right, go on and do 10 minutes. He did half an hour. He did half an hour. And then he came off, pinned me up against the wall and did the other half hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have to say that, he, you know, he used to come to the store and come into the dressing room. He was very polite, even yeah. when he was coked out of his head. He was uh, very polite. And he go, do you mind if I just come on and do a let? And I remember me and Ames uh, going up. No, of course. Yeah, go on and everything. And he went on and did this 10, which lasted 40. And we had to follow it. Oh. And by then he had sucked Every bit of laughter out of that room. It was, uh, uh, not, you, you know, those, Charles Fleischer was another one who did it, who was the voice of Roger Rabbit. Go on and do a tight 10, 40 minutes later. And so basically the audience have had a first half that's an hour and a half. And it is now the interval is turning up at half past one. So you're back on stage at two and the last act is on at half past two in the morning on a yeah. Friday. Do you know what I mean? And so they'd all been on the piss. You know, just like worn out alcohol. Um, 
And it was, those were the sort of like initiations of fire. If you could get through those gigs, you're all right. Well, that's why, you know, I think there is still that sort of bonding from all of us who started at that era because right. it's war stories as well, isn't it? As well, you know, I mean, we had the, the, the lovely Joe Brand on and, you know, Joe's war stories about it because it was harder for her yeah. uh, as really the only woman who was could take them on in the late show in the early days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, she was remarkable, was Joe. And uh, I, I mean, I, I loved her. I loved her. I loved gigging with her in the early days. She was brilliant. I think this. I, I wanted to just go on to this. It is war stories, but it's more than that. It's kind of like we've all seen each other without our dignity, oh, yeah. having had it stripped away from us. We have seen each other in triumph and in utter, utter humiliation. Bob Boyton always used to say, if you've died your worst death, which is really horrible, really horrible, and you've gone home and felt like topping yourself, and the next day you think, no, I'll give it another go. He said, you might be a comic. You know, and there is that kind of like, there is that, th th there's a shared experience. I wanted to, to mention one thing though about audience, which is which is we laugh more as an audience. We, we, we share. We share because laughter is about sharing. Um, and a very simple thing, if you've ever seen uh, The Big Sleep, right? Humphrey Bogart, Lauren Bacall, amazing film, right? Raymond Chandler, original novel, bit of a mind to get through and go, oh, what was the plot by the end of it? But if you've ever seen it at home, it's a good film. If you've ever seen it in a cinema that's packed, it's funny, man. It's really, really funny. The sharp dialogue between Lauren Bacall and between Humphrey Bogart is funny and it's full of sexual tension because they couldn't have sexual tension. You had to have it in dialogue, you know, yeah. in that rapid fire. The same as Cary Grant, you know, it, da, 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 bringing up baby, you know, with Catherine Hepburn. She's just remarkable. Do you know what I mean? It's just, it's beautiful. It's beautiful stuff. Um, if you watch Jackie Chan movies, early Jackie Chan movies, go and see the stuff he made in Hong Kong. Jackie Chan is, is basically Kung Fu's Buster Keaton. That's what he is, right? He is one of the most remarkable and funniest performers you will ever, ever see. Him and San Hong, who, who, who we often worked with in the early days, the most remarkable. Sam Hong was quite a big, big guy. They both trained uh, in the Chinese... Um, State, I, I forgot. There's a state, there's a state performing school where they, it might be in the, the opera where you learn tumbling and clowning and kung fu and all this kind of stuff, dance. And in fact, Michelle Yeoh went there as well, if I remember correct. She changed wow. as a dancer, Michelle Yeoh, before getting into martial arts. What's fascinating about someone like Jackie Chan is. And you can see you can see the tips and the winks all over the place. There's a film called Project A, in which he is. Um, he, there's a scene. It doesn't matter. There's a scene where he's hanging off a clock tower in the most remarkable homage to Harold Lloyd ever. Oh. It's full of it. It's just full of it all the time. Um, in one film, there's a film called the the, the Police Story which I saw at the Prince Charles Theatre. And it was a Hong Kong film that Jackie Chan directed. It's very funny. There's a scene where he answers telephones in an office. And of course, they're all corded because it was done in the, in the early 80s. And he's flipping it with his feet and catching it. And, and he's covered in cords. And it's like this monumental bit of clowning that you would expect to find in a Charlie Chaplin film. There's one scene, there's, there's one bit, though, which, which I think is really telling, which is he does a stunt, and it's kind of replicated in later films, but never as well. He's at the top floor of a shopping mall, and he runs and jumps and grabs hold of the lights, the big column of lights that go down, and he falls down it, and they pop as he goes. And he goes down it, and bang, he lands on the ground. And it's such a good stunt, they show it three times in the film. They cut away. <laughs> 
show it again. They cut away and show it again. And they do that because they know the audience think it's a great stunt and want to see it again. But also they know that it's in a cinema and it's going to be packed. And when I saw it in the cinema, everyone was just like, wow. And the place was alive. It was electric. People were clapping and cheering and laughing. And just, it was, and, and Jackie Chan made those films knowing they were going to be seen in a cinema. Knowing that people were going to be cheering and laughing and mucking about. That's a wonderful thing. Well, it, that takes us back to going to football, doesn't it? It's shared yeah. experience. Yeah. And, and and a really good uh, comedy crowd, a really good theatre crowd, a really good football crowd. It's that shared experience. You know, we go and see AFC despite the fact that we come away disappointed more times than we do it. But well, it's funny and it's um, a bonding experience with those around us anyway. I mean, I also go to try and get a linesman to, to give up the job. <laughs> <laughs> I told you the other week, that linesman at the Sutton game, I told you at the Sutton game, he, had, he did a really crap decision. Everyone's shouting and screaming. Anyway, the play continues. He starts running up the pitch. He goes past my mate who goes, don't let the defaults get you. You've got this line out. And it was his perfect heckle. The perfect heckle. It was just great. Oh God, no, no, we love it. No, everything. We won't go into the song that was sung about him for the rest of the match. No, we don't, don't do that. But I mean, he, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. But the point being is, all of if you look at what laughter does, it brings us together and it challenges people in power. That was part one of the Mark Thomas experience. Part two will be coming soon. The Humorology Podcast was hosted by Paul Barros. Produced by David Rose. Music by Steve Hayworth. Creative direction by Les Hughes. And additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production. <laughs>